to Look into Time in the Mystery. Time in the Mystery. With Mike Ben Mike Ben Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Time in the Mystery. Conversations with me, Mike Mangione. How are you? I'm doing well. Let's move on. Let's get on with it. This is Sean Daly today. Slug of Atmosphere, right? Hip-hop group out of Minneapolis. This conversation takes place in his car. He, uh, We're going to go do shots. Tetanus shots. That's the premise. Minneapolis, car, going to buy tetanus shots. All right? All right. Hey, subscribe to the podcast. If you haven't already, do it. That's all I'm going to say. I'm leaving that right there on the table and stepping back. If you enjoy the podcast, give it some uh, reviews. Give it a, a couple stars on iTunes. or Yeah, give it a review. I, I have one review already. Not that I'm, you know, uh, checking out my self and re- my reviews and stuff, but I am. I, I, there's one, so I saw it. It, it was by accident. I saw it, and uh, and it's a sh- it's you know it's nice. It's a good one. But when I saw it, I thought, hey, that's nice. Um, maybe I should say something on the show. So do it. Share the podcast with your friends. Uh, you know, tweet it out and say on Facebook, hey, this is a good podcast. Why would you do that? Well, number one, I'm asking you to. Number two, it helps the next one happen. It helps me put out the next episode if it continually gets bigger. It has been, but I want it to get huge. (laughs) All right? So, but I need your help for that. If you think it's of quality, if if you're like listening and you're like, this is great, then thanks, man. Like, shoot it out. I haven't been playing that much recently. I've been working on my latest record, do out, who knows? And uh, I've been working on the podcast, but I will start touring more this uh, fall. So check out my website, MikeMangione.com, for dates that will start coming up. But speaking of dates, I have one specifically I want to mention. August 13th, I'm part of the Strange Fruit Festival in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, at Company Brewing, a great festival, a great cause. That was actually uh, uh, one of the, the producers of it is my violinist. So you know how we got in, right? Do you like free downloads? Because I like giving them. That's right. I give free downloads. How? Mystery Monday. It's my newsletter. It comes out every other Monday. Go to my website, MikeMangione.com, and in the little field that says Mystery Monday, you put in your email address, press send, and then boom, you get a free download right there. And that's not it, though. I have, I have more downloads to give you. I don't know why I'm like really overselling the download thing when the reality is I don't have a lot to give, and... It's like how I make a living is selling music. So what the hell am I doing? I'm just trying to get friends. <laughs> I just answered my question, and I just stated the obvious. Uh, but anyway, whatever. Yeah, so, so go to, go to MikeManJoy.com, sign up for Mystery Monday. You'll get, a, you'll get a download on the spot, and then every other Monday, the Mondays after the podcast releases, I send out a newsletter with little like elements of mystery and whatnot and editorials and stuff like that. So if you want, if you're interested in that, which I think you should be, uh, in my humble opinion, go to MikeManJoy.com and sign up for Mystery Monday. Uh, eventually, I might have to stop giving downloads. Uh, maybe I'll do like uh, friendship bracelets or virtual stickers or just a little uh, email back that says, it was good to say thanks. Is that worth your time? <laughs> Holy crap, guys. I'm by myself right now, and um, I'm, I'm getting a little punchy. Sorry. Speaking of punchy, I have patrons that support what I do, and I, ha- I have some great patrons, and I, I'm, but I'm trying to work towards getting more so that I can send, so I can do a podcast a week. That's my goal. I need a few more patrons. So if you've been thinking about it, a patron is just someone who gives me a little bit, of, supports me a little bit financially on a monthly basis. Uh, some do ten dollars a month, some do fifty dollars a month, some some do a dollar a month. Whatever, it all helps. But if you're interested in being a patron, go to patreon.com forward slash Mike Mangione. That's p a t r e o n dot com forward slash Mike Mangione, and uh, be a patron. I'll announce you on the show. And I'll put you on my website. And then there's also little perks as well. But it's all there. So check out patreon.com forward slash 
Mike Mangione. So back in the day, we used to play with a band from Minneapolis uh, pretty often. The band was called Roma de Luna, and one of the members was Jessica, who is the wife of Sean, uh, Sean Daly. And so Sean would be out at our shows, and we'd hang out and, and all that good stuff. Well, when I did this, when I started this podcast, I knew that I wanted to have him as one of my guests for a couple of reasons. Number one, I love his lyrics. He has a great, he, they will love his choice of words, and um, I just think he's just a brilliant writer, a lyricist. I love it. Uh, also, because I'm so intrigued, he's been, he started this record label like over 20 years ago, and they're just, they're still going strong. That's so rare. So, in, in my opinion, uh, pound for pound, this guy's a monster, like in the best way, like, in, not like a Monsters in Corp type monster where the movie where they're not scared they're actually more just fluffy colorful whatever I'm getting off track but the point is the guy knows what he's doing and I respect him a lot for that musically and 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 business wise I just I respect him and uh, I've always enjoyed talking to him and he's uh, hilarious and so I I thought it'd be a great hang and it sure it surely was man he picked me up my band was playing in Minneapolis and so we drove to where he was doing a photo shoot for for the new record that's coming out this month and my band dropped me off and they did their own thing and then I got in his in Sean's car and he said look man I I got a fish hook in my finger and I need to get a tetanus shot and so we're gonna go I'm gonna buy you a tetanus shot and we're gonna go do shots and I said that sounds like a fantastic use of our time. And so we drove around Minneapolis looking for a place to get shots, and, and you'll hear that journey. And, uh, but what I love about, about this episode, listening back to it, was when we get to the point where he talks about why he's doing it. And anytime you ask an artist, why do you do what you do, unless they've like been prepped and, and like wrote out an ant, like had time to reflect on it, you never know what you're going to get. And w- I love his response. He didn't know I was going to ask him that. And, and, and on the spot, he gave me a response that I just, I think it's, it's, it's beautiful. And that's what I'm most excited for you, for you to, to hear. Um, we go through his past, we go through his process, we go through his mission. All right. So I'm excited for you to, to go through that journey with us. It's, it was a great day, a great conversation. Thank you, Sean, for doing it. Sean's a great guy. If you don't, if this is your first introduction to him, Check out his music. The guy's, um, he's a fluffy monster. One side note I just want to mention is that I'm using a mobile recording device. So you can hear some, uh, you can hear the car vibrations, some clicks and pops. It actually gets better as the conversation goes on. So just bear with it. And uh, it's still a great conversation, completely audible. So without further ado, I give you Time in the Mystery Conversations with Sean Daly. To the telephone. It's your wife. Yeah. Hi, you can just talk to Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's always good. Um, you know, let's turn on some A so it's not too loud. The windows. That haunted house is uh, it's like the best haunted house in the world as a kid until you realize that they can't touch you. So, <laughs> so once you realize that as a kid, then you can start jumping at them and they have yeah. to like back off you. Yeah. Hey, hey, can you hear me? Hey, what's the name of the clinic that I used to go to on France Avenue out there by South Hill? Quello, thank you. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna try. Yep. All right. I gotta go though. I love you. I don't know if I'd want to get touched by those guys though. Which guys? The guys in the house. The haunted house. Oh no, you won't be. No, I don't want to though. Yeah. So. But they won't touch you. That that's what makes me go into them is I know I'm not gonna get touched by them. Oh. Well, no. As a kid though. Right. You're supposed to be scared. Yeah. You know, and so these monsters are jumping at you. And then it's almost, a, it's like when you realize that Santa Claus doesn't really come down the chimney, he comes to the front door. You know, it's that, it's that thing where you realize uh, Santa Claus comes to the front door? Well, yeah, he's fat. He can't fit through the chimney. I'm sorry. He's, uh, he's weight he's challenged. He's thick bone. Is that, uh, what, yeah. Yeah, he's husky. He's husky. Uh,. I always get distracted by who, who are these people? Like, why are, what point happened where they decided to work at a haunted house? 
Oh, it's just a check, man. Like, I bet you there's some theater kids that work there, though. You know? It's That's like, true. it's kind of like, look, I like to act, and a job is a job, and I got to pay the rent. Now, do I want to, you know, take odd jobs acting in haunted houses and, and other places, or... or or do I want to go work at Rapid Oil Change? You know what I mean? Nothing, yeah. nothing against Rapid Oil Change, <laughs> right. but but if I could all, you know, hey, if Rapid Oil Change would let me dress up like the werewolf and act like the werewolf, that would be pretty awesome. I guess a good thing, too, is if you're, like, embarrassed, you're wearing a mask, so you're not necessarily being, you know, exposed. Nobody can see you. Yeah, there's that, too, I guess. Yeah. I used to play a sandwich shop. And for me, it was just something to do on a, you know, you tour during the weekends, like Thursday till Sunday. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I play the sandwich shop. And there's a part of me that, like, people would say, oh, aren't you playing that sandwich shop? I should come by. I want to come by. And I'd be like, no, don't. Please don't come don't by. Don't come by. <laughs> so if I could wear a mask, I guess, and put some werewolf makeup on, it would have been more of a ex- better experience for me. We're good because we're not in, in rush hour right now. And so, you know, I'm driving you a clinic that's kind of not that close. Mm-hmm. It's out by, like, where the... Um, Guess where the mall lives? Oh, maybe it's not even a clinic anymore. Maybe it's closed. So you stuck yourself with a, a fish hook. A fish hook. Yeah, a pretty dirty one at that. Uh, doing a photo shoot, I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, we're right. taking pictures. Uh, me and Aunt. So now we got to get a shot. We're gonna go get shots. Yeah. And, I, and you're, you're. I'm gonna buy you you're one. Gonna buy me a shot. Yeah, I'm gonna buy you a shot, and I'm gonna buy me a shot. So you grew up here. I grew up in Minneapolis, yep. And what part? Uh, south Minneapolis. It's, uh, it's, it's on the south side of downtown. Um, Minneapolis is split into two sides, the north side and the, and the south side. And downtown separates it. And then the Twin Cities are split in two as well. And that's basically split by the river. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got Minneapolis on one side of the river and St. Paul on the other side of the river. Okay. Um, I grew up on the south side of Minneapolis, wedged in between... Deep South, and I guess what you would consider to be Whittier Avenue, or mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Whittier neighborhood. So where I grew up, it was a blue collar, you know, two parent and one parent families. It was a pretty integrated neighborhood, um, especially when I was growing up. Uh, white people, black people, and Native American families. Um, and the schools I went to kind of were very they, they reflected my block even like yeah. the block that I grew up on I, I pretty much have lived on that block my whole life even though I've moved to different blocks I've always kind of been on a block that reflects that I mean right now I actually live a little deeper south where the neighborhood gets a little nicer uh, I moved south of the creek you know if you were from here you would know that means yeah. basically the promised land that's what we used to call the promised land when okay. I was a kid we used to so you're, you're getting there slowly. fantasize about you know dating the girls from that side of the creek you know what I mean like right. uh, so now I actually moved over there and it's not as promised as I thought it was as a kid you know what I mean but sure. it's it's uh, it works it works for me and, 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 and my nuclear family yeah and so were, were you there the whole time in that area south side um, you know, for one year, I moved to the north side, northeast, actually, Minneapolis. And it just wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. It was a little bit more, uh, it was a little depressing for me, you know, growing up where I grew up, which was very, uh, I was I, I was always motivated to be creative in, yeah. in my neighborhood. Whereas when I moved over there, I didn't have that same motivation, you wow. know. I'm not sure, you know, and it probably was more of a reflection of where my life was at at the time, if anything. And so I did one of those things where it was like, well, I got to get out of here. I'm going to cut my hair and I'm going to dump my, you know, and move on. Well, I kind of did that version of that. I just moved back south and, of course, it magically fixed everything. It's funny, like, the first time I really feel like, because I used to feel that too with with neighborhoods. But, I mean, in actuality, there's so much you have in common with those sides. You know, I didn't... I used to identify as being Irish and Italian. Like, I'm an Irish-Italian kid, right? Right. Until I went to Ireland, and then I went to Italy, and I'm like, I am in no way uh, Irish or yeah, Italian. Yeah, no, you're an Irish-Italian-American, which is a very different Completely thing. different yeah, experience. Yeah. But, I mean, that goes for pretty much every ethnicity that here totally. is here in America. Like, I, I feel like if, if everybody did find their motherland, they'd realize that uh, it's not the same. 
as their neighborhood was here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and then even when I lived down in Los Angeles, I still, like, I never knew what it meant to be from the Midwest until I lived in L.A. Oh, gotcha. Oh, my yeah, gosh. Yeah. I'm going to use this as a segue to try calling these people again. Go for it. Man, crap in a biscuit. All right, where can we go? So, uh, me, urgent care. Urgent Care Clinic. Okay, check it out. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't want to check that out, Siri. Wikipedia, Bone Thugs and Harmony. Okay, check it out. Read it to me. Bone Thugs and Harmony is an American hip hop group from Cleveland, Ohio. I don't it know consists that. of rappers Busy Bone, Wishbone, Lazy Bone, Crazy Bone. Flesh and Bone, American West Coast rapper Easy, former member of rap group NWA, signed Bone Thugs and Harmony to Ruthless Records in late 1993, All when right. Bone Thugs debuted with their AP Green Hanukkah Monday. All right. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Southside, South, so obviously Southsiders was, the, that's the last record, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, what? So what would, like, was there music around you at the time? Like, how did you become saturated with it like where was it who who was the person handing it to you like educating you um my father was you know my first you know my parents my, my, my dad and my mom were my, my, my first entrances into uh becoming a just somebody that appreciated music the way that I did I had young parents and so I guess you know I don't know that I would have recognized this early on but uh, I, I guess there was a, uh, I guess, I guess music was not just the language of the notes or the composition, but also the language of the culture that went along with youth. Uh, I had young parents, you know, my parents were in their teens. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're together? They were together yeah. at the time. They were together. Yeah. They, 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 they split up later when I was 11. But so around five, you know, when I was five, my dad was like 23. And he, you know, he used music like a 23-year-old would. You know, it's not just something you listen to, but it's a part of your life. It's a part of your identity. It's a, it's a, it's a statement that you're making to your community. Yeah. And so to me, music was meant to be played in the car loudly. Mm-hmm. Um, and early on, I was introduced to rap music. And where'd that come from? From him. From him. Right? Yeah. Um, Rapper's Delight. Uh, happened I was probably six that's a guess Mm -hmm. when I heard music like that come you know the beginning of that coming out of my father's car do you you remember a moment when it became your music yeah Run DMC made it my music Um, I must have been about 11 Mm -hmm. and hearing Run DMC rap I knew this was not me you know this was this was too this was angry. This was too much for my dad. Mm-hmm. This was for me, you know. Um, they were, you know, they were barking at you. They were no longer using their voices in a way to try to lure you in. Yeah. They were yelling like rock stars. They were yelling like they were mad, and they were, you know, probably this, probably the same way punk rock started to speak to some kids at 11, 12, 13 years old. Rap started speaking to me that way, you know. Prior mm-hmm. to that. Rap was just the music that I listened to in my dad's car or with my dad. No different than R&B. Rap and R&B were the same thing to me. Earth, Wind & Fire and Sugar Hill Gang were not that different to me, you know? Um, Run DMC was when I was like, what is this? And why? So there's a message. It wasn't just like... A, a syncopated beats, rhythms, and melody. There's an actual message that I was... mean, there was a message in the earlier stuff too that my dad listened to. I was picking up on the stuff that Melly Mel was saying, you know, mm-hmm. they, and, and he was saying things that were that seemed adult to me, you know. Um, but Run DMC was it was more like it was a feeling. It was like yeah. there was a it was so aggressive. Yeah, it wasn't just. A groove, but it was the fact there was no groove. Yeah. You know, they were banging on you. You know what I mean? Like, and I think that that was what kind of it didn't only speak to me and tell me that that was for me, but it it, it brought me in. 
it yeah. made me a part of it. Yeah. And from there, it, you know, I was, I was, I fully embraced it. You know, I started buying records with my little two dollars a week allowance for for a dollar forty forty nine. I think it was. You could go get a, you know, what we called forty fives. They call them seven inches now, but you could go get a forty five from a store on Lake Street called the Wax Museum, for. Mm -hmm. For a dollar fifty, basically, and for two fifty, you could get two. So they're basically they'd sell you one forty-five for a buck fifty, but for another buck, and for every other buck on top of that, you could pick out another forty-five. Mm -hmm. And so I slowly started purchasing forty-fives, which then led me to saving and purchasing for my first full length, which then led to this addiction, full-blown addiction that I have now with with purchasing records. Yeah. At what, what you said, like eleven, twelve, yeah. around this time, yeah. and what was the year? Oh. Roughly. 83, 84. 83. How were they speaking to you, though? Like, was it... I mean, I couldn't necessarily relate yeah. to what Run DMC was saying. Yeah. Because they were talking to, you know, they were talking to teenagers. Mm -hmm. And I was still just a kid, man. I still just wanted to play. Yeah. But they were talking, you know, the, the song 30 Days or Hard Times or, or whatnot. You know, they were talking about things that were like... I was familiar with because it sounded like stuff my dad talked about, but my dad just never was quite that good at making me catch on. You know, the fact that they were making it rhyme also played into, you know, as kids. Yeah, there's an appeal to there's that. There's an appeal to rhyme. You know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? Like, you know, uh, there's a another record that had a huge impact on me, even though I never owned it until, uh, man, a few years ago, I finally found a copy of it or finally cared enough to actually purchase one. Uh, Eddie Murphy had a record called... Like singing? Well, not really. He was rapping. Uh, it's called Up Your Butt. It was a comedy record. Yeah. And he had a song in there called Up Your Butt where he was like, put a frying pan up your butt. Put a garbage yeah. can up your butt. You I know? remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so, as a kid, that was the first time I actually started imitating rap. Because he did that, and then we're all in, you know, the seventh grade or something at this point. We're like, we started making our yeah. own versions of Up Your Butt. What? Put a notebook up your butt, you know. Yeah. Put a put a phone book up your butt, whatever, you know. And and, 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 and coming up with our own Up Your Butts. <laughs> and that was like my first rapping. Because you could take ownership of Up Your Butt. You could do anybody. <laughs> Nobody gets the butt. You know what I'm saying? You're not appropriating nothing. <laughs> When did you start writing then? Did, what did you... With, uh, junior high. Junior high. After that Eddie Murphy thing, <clears throat> I started writing my own rhymes. Now that meant just taking other people's already famous rhymes and changing them to meet my needs. Mm -hmm. So having your own version of Lottie Dottie or having your own version of, uh, you know, Request Line or these the songs that, uh, that were popular at the time, it was a good way to get other kids to notice you because we all knew the song, but you just flipped it and change the lyrics. And I think that was actually more impactful than if I had just had, had some original rhymes sure. in junior high because nobody, everybody's like, oh yeah, you're, you're rhyming. But for me to take something that you're already familiar with, you know, it's like taking the theme song to Fraggle Rock and changing the words. The kids recognize yeah. it as Fraggle Rock and now... So who who was the outlet then for this? Were you actually singing these songs for kids other friends that yeah. also did their versions you know what I mean right. it was almost kind of like you had you know when I was in junior high I had like my four rap friends there was lots of kids that liked rap but there's yeah. only about four of us that were like trying to rap Yeah. you know Michael Banks was a beatboxer he was one of my earlier friends and he was so good at beatboxing that he would he would beatbox and then and then those of us that cared to would rap along mm -hmm. you know at what point then did that start transitioning from you know, uh, getting a reaction, singing over familiar stuff into, I think I can actually like create like from ground zero here and, you know, try to impact like you, w when did you start wanting to take complete ownership of it and, and create your own thing? Um, high school, I didn't really know how to go about it. You yeah. know, there was plenty of us that rapped. And when we did, it was usually we battled each other. It was usually just a way for us to socialize with other people that shared the same interests. Yeah. Um, and then somewhere in high school, I started writing songs that were compositions. And after that, you go, well, 
I want to show this to somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, you want some, you want to see if it sucks. You want to see if anybody would like it, you know? And that's when I started trying to figure out ways into different talent shows and things of that nature. Um, how, how do they go over? Talent shows are, you know, they're great because they're, 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 they're not, they're not really, uh, it's not like you're being put on some sort of like chopping block and people yeah. are actually deciding whether or not you suck. It's just, you know, every, at a talent show, we just, we celebrate the love to be creative yeah. and, the, and, the, and the want to be talented, not so much are we celebrating the fact that we're talented. You know, sure. I mean, of course, once in a while, there's like a 14-year-old that can play something on the piano that blows everybody yeah. away. But for the most part, it's more about nurturing that desire, you know. Sure. And so they went over great. You know, all of my friends would cheer for me and tell me I did so good and, 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 and girls liked it. You know what I mean? Things, you know, the type of validation that you want was there but you know I, I even then as a kid I knew that it wasn't because I was actually good you know yeah. it, it took a long time to actually become good at this why well, for, for me growing up I grew up playing drums and same thing talent shows all the time I was always like I just remember everybody being so just floored by it by my playing but basically because I'm a kid playing drums sure yeah. there's nothing to do with, and I reflect on it it was horrible I mean it was it's kind of I and and I think I mentally just stopped like as far as development goes I just kind of shut it off because I felt like I, I was getting this affirmation you know I was the only kid that was playing drums one of the only kids playing an instrument so I didn't really feel like I needed to do, I, and I didn't do this like consciously it was very subconscious you know but like I kind of stopped shut everything down as far as like learning more and developing you know so but you obviously didn't do that like so what if people were giving you this affirmation was there something though that you're still like well I wasn't the only kid rapping for one okay and so I was always able to kind of compare myself to my peers and I always knew which peers were better than me yeah. I mean even to this day that motivates you. I know which of my peers are better than me now you know what I mean it's yeah. like I'm, I'm you know uh, also I, I started off as a break dancer before I was even right. trying to spotlight myself as a rapper and even then you know at an earlier age seven eight and showing up at the little break dance talent shows or the little break yeah. dance extravaganzas I knew I wasn't as good as some of the other kids but I was getting the same validation they were getting because mm -hmm. it's you know I guess I just I learned early on that the adults just want to nurture this in the kids so that the kid will make it grow you know what I mean like and I, I respect that and I still I, I try to play my role now as the adult and make sure that when I see a kid doing something that shows any potential mm -hmm. you know let that kid know whoa that's an amazing vehicle did you have yeah no. what is that I have no idea. It's like right out of the movie Cars. <clears throat> did you have a moment though that was? Uh, did you have like the the epiphany where I go, I meant to do this. This is for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like three weeks ago in Berkeley. Was yeah, it? You know, no, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> dude, that's I'm, I'm still chasing it, but I've had it. But I'm chasing it, but I've sure, had it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's a never ending relationship. Well, it's a mo it's a humble disposition I think is to know that there's always better and not, not only I think when you mentioned like you had peers like for me I know exactly what you said I know people that are better and that it's not like I want to be better to be better than them I just know the potential sure yeah and it's worth chasing yeah and that's you know and I think that's I mean here's the thing you know let's look at just even the arc of my career we started making music in uh in the 90s under the name Atmosphere we, we put out our first actual bona fide CD or whatever you want to call it in, in the late 90s 97 and I became a school of rappers that you know there's this indie rap kind of gold rush that happened and I was one of a hundred rap groups mm -hmm. that took part in this and as a nation? as a nation yep okay. nationwide and and, 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 and you know, did my best to network and become friends with as many of these guys as possible. Now, here we are 20 years later, and out of that 100, there's only like five of us still doing stuff. Who's that? Oh, I don't know. I'm just, and that's an arbitrary yeah, number. Yeah. Like, I, but, but I guess I'm just saying, like, there's so few of us that were a, actually able to not just capture the moment, but continue going. 
And I think that a big part of that was because we all knew we had to evolve and grow and get better and keep shooting for higher and looking for, and I don't mean shooting for higher as far as like any sort of sales benchmark yeah. or popularity thing, but, but trying to figure out how to do it better. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, hopefully I will try to figure out how to write the perfect song for the rest of my life. Yeah. And hopefully I'll never actually nail it. Hopefully it will just be this thing that I'm chasing because I enjoy that chase. Yeah. I've, I've been enjoying that chase forever. And I have not written the perfect song yet. In in 30 years of writing songs, I haven't written the perfect song yet. And and I hope that it never happens, but I hope that my, you know, my desire to make it happen is what stays in place. Has it has it waned in any way over your years? Have you found yourself in situations where you're catching yourself be like, "Man, I really don't care as much" or uh, or or is it always on constant full throttle full throttle desire to I can't to do it. say that yeah. I uh, you know I can't say that I I guess consciously have ever reached a point where I felt like I didn't care as much mm -hmm. but I'm the worst judge of my own art because I stand too close to it so it would yeah. be better to ask somebody who doesn't even know me but who has been following my career hey has Sean ever reached a place where you think he hasn't cared as much and you might get different answers then, sure. you know but for me, from my perspective, no. Because, you know, here's the thing. Like, by, like I said, 97, I put out my first actual official CD. And that was a big deal at the time. Which one was that? That was Overcast. Okay. And CDs were still this thing that was like, for somebody like me, I used to make tapes. Yeah. And so making a CD was a huge deal. And so that's where I always look at as my debut. Even though I was putting out records before that, but just as four-track tapes or just whatever. I had projects prior to that. But that was the first official thing and, and 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 since then you know I guess uh, I've only I've only desired to well here's the thing you know especially now I'm I'm a I'm dependent on it now mm -hmm. like this is what I do and this is how I feed my family and so that dependency breeds love hate just like any dependency you're, you're dependent on your parents you're dependent on teachers you're dependent on cops you're dependent on things and it creates a love-hate relationship. That anything that's authoritative over you yeah. is gonna you're gonna hate it. And music is because authoritative it, yeah. over me. You because know what I mean? Because it hurts so much when it lets you down. So there's been times yeah. where I've been angry with it, but it's never made me not give a fuck. Mm -hmm. But you know, also in the same breath, I am, you know, I'm fortunate in that I got to make a career out of this. I got to make something. I mean, I'll never take that for granted. You know, I was 27 before I ever saw a dime and then by the time I was actually dependent on it I was 31 now if I was 17 when I saw my first dime yeah. and I was 21 then who knows what kind of mind state I'd have had but at 31 with an already you know uh, 10 year old son man the last thing I was doing was taking this shit for granted I'd already ran through a series I'd, I'd already been in the workforce for 12 years of shitty jobs you know what I mean like by the time I was able to finally quit my jobs, I was, you know, I was 31. Yeah. And that's a, that, that's a perspective that a lot of young musicians never get to have. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their perspective is like, it's a big party. Like I came into it, party was already over by the time yeah. I was allowed to actually party, you yeah. know? All right, this is a great a great time to pause and see if we can get these people you to give it. us some shots. Let's see what's up. <laughs> All right. I'm going here with my beekeeper outfit. All right, so I can't get a tetanus shot for the people listening because I am not a part of their health care plan. Is that where the... You've never been a customer here before, and so you would need an appointment. In which case, that probably means that they would see you and check you out for a couple of things just to get a rough of your history or mm. to see, to make sure you're not, I don't know, coming in here with, the, like, Ebola or the plague or anything like that. Yeah. You know? um, which, I guess, makes sense. I get that. I, you know, it would be kind of weird if they're just like, yeah, yeah shut out. Yeah, shut shut There, man. everybody gets one. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but whatever, man. You snooze, you lose. I'm gonna get a tetanus shot. I think you should. I man, I might as well. Like I wanna I wanna you know, it's been a long time since I've You should see what other shots you can get and just make it like a, a day of uh, 
juice in your arms. All right, so going back, I guess, I don't know, having people that you play with, I kind of feel like there's um, almost a sense of accountability, you know, like it kind of keeps you in check because your peers become kind of a, a reflector in a sense to kind of reflect how you're doing, you know, compared to how they're doing. I don't, and I don't mean like success as far as like sales or anything, but like the craft. Sure. Like how like, your craft stands up. Like you would think that if... Uh... If I was just mailing it in or running through the motions, Ant would check me. He'd be like, hey, mm. what are you doing? This sucks. Does he? Um, I would think so. You know, he's good at being like, yeah, I'm not feeling that song. But the thing is, I usually know before I even show him mm. if it's going to be something that he's not going to make. You know, me and him, I guess oh. to give a little backstory, me and him, uh, Ant, we make music together. He makes beats. I make raps. We squish them together and they make songs. And we've been working together for 20 years now. And that's a that's a lot longer than almost any band I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a lot of my idols didn't last 20 no. years, you know? That's rare. They're and, ready for you, by the way. Oh, well, yeah. we'll come back to that. All right. All right. What's been like the, the best experience so far with the release, working the release? Oh, this recent one? Yeah. Um, last year... We spent a lot of time on the road. Uh, I would say from May to May. Sean? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. <laughs> you looking for a tennis shot? Yes, please. All right. So I did look in your chart. You had one in 2009. Did I? Yeah. And what is it, 2015? Yep. So you're good until 2019. So good for 10 years. You should schedule one. For, for, for 2019. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't really need one. You don't need one? I mean, if it's something that you want. Well, here's what happened. I put, a, I put a fish hook into my finger today. Okay. Didn't even draw blood. Okay. Just put it under the skin. Remember when we were kids and you used to put little needles under your skin and you'd be like, look, I'm sewing myself or whatever we did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't record that. No, no. That's not okay. And, uh, uh, and, and it was like, ah, you know what, I'm going to call my wife. And she was like, ah, it's probably no big deal. I was like, ah, I'm going to call my mom. She's an alarmist. You better go get a tetanus shot. And so I'm like, I don't need one. But now you're telling me I definitely don't need one. I mean, no, you have one. You're covered. I mean, it's not going to hurt if you want a booster, though. Let's do a booster. Okay. All right. Let's Wait, go. come on back. Yeah. Because right. at least then I can not lie to my mom. Right. <laughs> that's worth it. Will you let me put it in my left arm? Yeah, that's cool. Fine. That's cool. All right, go ahead and take a seat and let me go grab it right here real quick. Thank you. Yep. Can he record us on a... We're doing an interview right now, and yeah, this, this is, is part of it. I was like, you're coming with me to do that's this. Fine. That's fine. It's cool. not like a camera recording. No, no, no. no, no, no. no that's that's fine. Okay, cool. Yep. No. Why the left arm? Uh, for holding for holding. My oh, yeah, yeah. All right. I don't All want... Right. You know, just in case it's sore, I don't want to... I don't want to be like, yeah, I can't pick you up for two days. Yeah, you know, yeah. that'll loot me. He'll lose his shit. The... Oh, man, I, I left off asking about... Um, oh, most yeah. most fun I've had working this record is the amount of traveling we did, mm -hmm. you know? Um, didn't necessarily go anywhere exotic, but I was able to go back to all the towns that I feel like I hadn't had a chance to go to in a while. Mm -hmm. You know, usually when we're working a record, I bring a plan to, the, to everybody. And I'm like, here's what I'd like to do for this record. And, and I'm pretty good at strategizing. Uh, and these last few records, there's been like kids on the way or mm -hmm. things happening that have made me a little more leery of, of traveling too much. Whereas this time I was like, you know what, let's get it in before Malcolm starts school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was after the, after Oscar was born, like I was, I was kind of free to really go to work. And so I was able to do a ton of traveling and then do like this weekend warrior style tour, yeah. which is Great, because then I get to be home all week with the family and then go Especially out. Especially during summer. Oh, man. It's been great. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Will we set for this? Yes. Yeah. All right. You want your left arm? Yes, please. All right. So here's this for you. Information on it. Totally. Take it. Don't yep. take it. Just have to... I will take it. I love to Say I stuff. gave it to you. So basically just <laughs> real loosey-goosey on the arm there. So can you get like as many tetanus shots as you'd like? Is it that kind of... I mean, it doesn't hurt. They say not like, you know, yearly get one, mm -hmm. but maybe, you know, every can you five not go... years. Yeah, no. Okay, cool. Just do it no. slow. Yeah, well, well you don't have to go gonna... slow either, but just... <laughs> go ahead, relax. I can feel your muscles. Oh, uh, I'm trying. That's a compliment. 
All right. And done. Oh, that was nothing. <laughs> Is that a tear? No, that was, <laughs> no, that was <laughs> seriously, once she told me to, once she reminded me that I was tense and yeah. I went and just kind of yeah. breathed it out. I was focusing on the breath. It's the same thing when I get cupping. Like, I just recently got cupping done, and so my back is a mess. It looks like a, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that hurts. Like, this was yeah. nothing. So I got cupping two days ago, and cupping's like getting a tattoo. You know what I mean? Like, this was like... I don't know what cupping is. I'm not right? sure. You okay, know, yeah. been like... Oh, cupping is where um, they take cups, and they put them on you, and they suction. And then they move the cup around you, and basically it draws blood out of the muscles. And and I think I'm explaining this right, but it, it basically it helps to detoxify places that are sore. So a uh, chiropractor who used to work here, she did um, or she did um, it's called Garastin. It was very similar to that, but she used like a beveled instrument and put like a, a jelly on you, yeah. and then would go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally, totally. That might be like, the same thing. Yeah, 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 and then you could tell it would break up, and you would have like the red spots on it. Yeah, that you yep. could tell that's, 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 up. that's where it's bad. The hard, the darker the red, the more. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's totally, that's totally what it is. Yeah, I don't know why we call it cupping. I mean, because that's just what my yeah. chiropractor. Because it's my chiropractor that does it. She's oh, like, okay. Applied kinesiologist. Yep. Yeah, yep, yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Thank you no. for. Yeah, no problem. Uh, move your arm around today better it's usually you feel it later within the day okay um so the more you move around the better you'll be in the long run that's good and i wanted in the left so i could carry my kid to the right so yep all right cool all righty thank you yeah no problem you guys have a good one all right you as well thanks you're able to go back to towns like small um, are they small towns college towns smaller towns and college towns you know the last few years we've had to be more strategic about making sure to get the most bang for our buck sure. you know the most for for the fewest travel but now you had more time now i have more time so i was able to go back to places that i hadn't seen since maybe 2009 or even earlier and uh it was just great. It was amazing because it got me, you know, uh, we touched off on earlier. I'm a, I'm a little bit, I have a little bit of a problem, an addiction to purchasing records mm -hmm. and going back to these smaller towns is, you know, that's that, when you're my kind of addict, that's exactly what you want. Yeah. You know, like the big cities have all been picked over and, all right, and yeah. there's just a ton of DJs, you know, whereas, you know, what are you always looking for when you go there? I don't have a wish list anymore. When I was younger, I was definitely more into specific genres but now that i i kind of don't really have a specific genre for what i listen to anymore so i'm just looking for either stuff that i know hold maintained value mm -hmm. or uh because i'll buy a record that i won't listen to like i'm that kind of dude where i'm like you know what right now this record lists on wikipedia for 80 bucks and i'm looking at a copy of it for nine i'm about to buy it and that's the reason because I don't know why, for some reason, I think someday I'll have the time to sit down and resell it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess it's like, you know, when, when when a parent passes, they leave you with a whole bunch of crap. So I'm just trying to make sure the crap I leave my kids with is like pretty cool. possibly like sellable. <laughs> Rather than being like a bunch of old mail that I never threw away or phone books or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Cats. Yeah, cats. Let's uh, let's let's leave uh, let's leave them with some some records and some comic books, you know? Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of jumping back a little bit, but when you were younger and the music was coming in, uh, you mentioned some R and B, hip hop. W was it pretty much a wide variety of genres, or was it was your dad kind of specifically? Oh, it was pretty much R and B, rock, reggae, and hip hop. Yeah. You know. What um, spoke to you the most? Hip hop, hip hop. Right. Yeah. Well, when I was a younger kid, probably pop yeah. music. You know, yeah. um, when I was younger, younger, just like any kid. You know, I mean, it's, pop music is created for kids to get it stuck in their heads. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's 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 and and, and, the, and the best thing, you know, that's the thing too. Coming from where I came from, as a as a young artist, we're supposed to front on pop music. Yeah, I'm not supposed to like pop music. I'm supposed right. to think that it's the worst thing to happen to art, mm -hmm. but. I don't buy it. You know, music that gets kids excited, like a kid could hear a pop song for the very first time and want to dance, that, that's some special shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, and, and, and it's, I'm not speaking to the idea of a kid hearing a song too many times and so they've got it memorized. Sure. But I mean, if that kid hears that 
that that uh, Taylor Swift song, and this is the first time the kids ever heard Taylor Swift, and that kid starts dancing, then Taylor Swift nailed it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, and so as a as a youth, I'm from that same school of thought. But once I started to develop more uh, of an identity crisis, like all teens do, that's when I started to really filter and make sure that the only music I was I was allowing myself to hear was, you know created independently of the industrial monster and probably yeah. under the under under the influence of some sort of uh, drug yeah look and your music has I mean you're definitely saying something like you have um, there's a story you're a very good storyteller but what I love is the instrumentation you have like just really good sounds like I, I can't get um, is it uh my girl's got two lovers. Mm. Just that, that that song, it just on its own, separate from the from the vocals, it's just it's a killer song. Man, those drums on that song are amazing to me. They're like uh they're almost country drums, but like it's a deep pocket. I call them metal, not because they're heavy metal but because you can hear all the metal in the actual yeah. drum work you can hear that the this 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 the the, the symbols are more than just uh, decorative they're actually super important to mm -hmm. the sound you totally. know what I mean like the ride is, is super important to the sound and, and I love that because it's rare that I hear rap music do that sure you know so that's important oh yeah 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 it's yeah. important to Anthony first because you know I kind of subscribe to his version of making music when it comes to like the actual composition of the music you know mm -hmm. like he's taught me a lot about how to appreciate that you know, if I worked, if I grew up working with a different producer, maybe I wouldn't be as focused on that. Maybe I would be more focused just on does it bang, yeah. or does it, you know, like we were just talking about with pop music, does it make people want to dance? Who knows what I would have been focused on? It's just that me and Anthony happened to come together, and we were both so hungry and prolific at the same time mm -hmm. that it clicked. Like we we met on that. That was our our bond was that we both would rather be doing this we'd rather sit up all night making music than doing anything else well and I, I think like what you're saying about like Taylor Swift there's somebody just making something that dances man that's such a quality like one of my favorite drummers is uh, is Levon Helm and he talked about in his early days when he was starting off like he just watched feet mm. he just make sure that the, mm. if the feet were moving he's doing his job and that's, that's great. yeah that's the, the value it's, it's such an important value to have that movement but I think the marriage of uh, of movement vibe and purpose is like the perfect song I think that is you know those elements do make the perfect song but I, I can also I've heard perfect songs that don't have an agenda I don't know if it's like I'm not saying there's like an agenda like 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 a, a specific intention but I just feel like it's it, 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 that way. Then it's banging on all cylinders, you know. Like I think of, like for instance, like Levon Helm plays. He played in the band The Band. Yeah. And man, they had the beat. They had. Oh yeah. The they, had the, they had the perfect storm. They definitely had what. Yeah. And then they had the concept. They had the lyrics. They had uh, everything was there. You know, I I think the. The band is a great example of that. Stevie Wonder is probably a great example of that as mm -hmm. well. You'll probably find, you know, if you dig through his catalog, you'll find stuff that that did work on all levels. You know, but who now? And and, and, and are we only able to say this retrospectively about Stevie Wonder and the band? Yeah. Like, at the time, were we able to say that? Or were we looking at it with more of a an eye that was actually filtering through a little bit harder? You know what I mean? Like... Mm -hmm. Because the fact is, you know, Superstition by Stevie Wonder resonates with us not just because of, the, of, of what it is, but it resonates with us because of what it did to the rest of right. the world, the rest of music. You Which know? you have to be aware of. Because I had, I had a moment when I was like, man, I think I was a teenager, right? I didn't understand the Beatles. I don't get it. And then I had to realize that 
the Beatles existed at a time that the Beatles never existed. I my understanding of music is post Beatles. Yeah, totally. And it's changed everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. That's and exactly, and that's I guess um, why. Even though technically Radiohead was probably a better band than the Beatles, mm-hmm. if you really just break it down, you wouldn't. You needed the Beatles to get Radiohead. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Then, the importance of the the drum tones and the you know you have strings in there. You got. And at one point you're playing the live band, I remember, right? Yeah. 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 So that's important. You're like you, you value that, uh, that tone and that quality. Uh, why? Is it because you just think it makes a better song, or mm. like what are you running for? For I think with a lot of that, I'm just trying to do different things. More so, what can I do that I haven't already done? Mm-hmm. Or oh, that the way that's said sounds kind of arrogant. More so. Um, how can I be careful not to repeat myself? That's a better way to phrase that, I think. Um, how can we be careful? And, and not only that, but how can we try to do things that nobody in our genre is doing? And I don't mean, I don't, I don't need to reinvent the wheel or, or I'm not, I'm not trying to push the envelope so far. I've never really felt like an experimental guy, mm-hmm. but more so like how, how can I set up some rules? How can I also work within the rules of this culture that were already built? Because I really love those rules. Those rules are, I think, actually important yeah. to the glue of this. And working within these rules still create a fingerprint that is solely mine. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think in contemporary music in general, we are all so influenced by stuff that happened last year as well as five years ago. Yeah. As much as we are by the Beatles and stuff that happened 40 years ago. Um, but we have, so we are so chock full of influences that it's really easy to either sound like your influence or sound like the void that's being influenced by too much. Mm-hmm. And so how do you, how do I find my own fingerprint within this so that you can't really call my influences, you know? Sure. And that was always important to me. I or know, or I know. you can see them, you can recognize them, but know that you're, you're dancing on top of them. Exactly. Moving, I'm, moving not, in yeah, a I'm not, I'm not trying, like, I'm not trying to give you the same rhetoric. You know, I, I'm a son of Chuck D and Karis One. I am a son of Big Daddy Kane. These, just like every other rapper my age is a son of these guys, mm-hmm. but how do I create my own sons sure. in this? You know, like, man, I just had a conversation. I, I don't know if it's on a podcast or somebody, but I've always felt like, you know, being a guy from like in Americana music and, and kind of folk and stuff. There's so many people you meet that are trying to be Bob Dylan in, in, in a very, in a very specific way. And it's, you know, it's like a certain phrasing and cadence and, and poetic license and even like melodies. Like they're just kind of, you can tell they're like walking right on his back, and it's like if you want to be more like Bob Dylan, you have to do what Bob Dylan did, how he did it, not what he's doing. You know, you don't want to sound like him. Man, I would tell you this: if you want to be more like Bob Dylan, you should probably never have listened to Bob Dylan. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and and I and I feel that. You know, it's funny because I've never been a fan of Bob Dylan, but I've had people go, "So I'm assuming you're a big fan of Bob Dylan, right?" Really? You know, and I it's why because I rhyme. I get it. Bob Dylan liked to rhyme too. You have some pretty unorthodox rhymes, though, and I think, I think he, he had that too. Like finding that, finding ways to make certain words work. Right. But in full disclosure, I'm not a fan of Bob Dylan. I'm yeah. actually the opposite, and it's not that I'm a hater. I respect him, but I never got past his voice. His right. voice always annoyed me, and it's great because in my world people say that about me they're like man yeah atmosphere is cool but he's i can't get past his voice he sounds like a whiny nerd and it's like yeah that's good yeah then you got it (laughs) yeah well it it, that well because then i know if you're into my shit you're into my shit right you know what i'm saying like this isn't i didn't have to trick you into liking me right i didn't have to pull any uh bells and whistles on top of my shit mm. to get you to dig this like you, it's the you check either, at the door you do or you don't yeah, you know yeah. what I mean like and I appreciate that because it lets me know what I'm working with I completely agree so so what do you, you mentioning like your fingerprint like you have your son of Chuck D KRS1 and we're talking about dancing on, but like not standing on their backs but like 
like moving in their in their wind current, like moving in their direction, like obviously influenced, but like taking it further. How do you see your like? What is your identity then? Like, what's your fingerprint that you think, no matter what the song is or the sound of the the, the tonality of the instruments, one thing's always constant, and it's this. I think the one thing that's always constant for us is that. Uh, I mean, this is a this answer probably would change every six months if you ask me. It's a good question. I, I guess um. The one thing that we have managed to kind of adhere to has has been, uh, I mean, for lack of a better way to phrase it, because I don't want to sound cliche and just say, well, we keep it very real, because I don't mean it in the way well, that they... you can say it and then I don't mean it in the way it. that they mean keep it real when they say keep it real, but I mean, like, I don't speak outside of... I, I don't... I'm not going to paint a picture that isn't realistic. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to... You know, a lot of music, I think, inspires hopes and dreams, but I also need to let you know that there's like a, what's the opposite of a silver lining? There's a purple lining around it. A reality There's lining. a reality yeah. lining. You know, yeah. there are consequences for your decision making. A lot of music offers you, you know, a look into decision making without consequence. I think, I, I completely agree, and I think it's important to point towards the sky but never let go of the ground mm. you know like always have your hand in the dirt mm-hmm. because if you forget the dirt you're not realistic realistically going in the proper direction I think yep. I've just never been able to relate too much with with overly overly optimistic optimistic or, it's putting it's kind of putting your fate into this uh uh you're, you're, you're putting it into this this like box mm-hmm. and you're not even in control of the box and I kind of feel like that's the opposite of how it's supposed to work especially the, the, the idea of faith and, 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 mm-hmm. and if you're going to mix fate and faith together I feel like it's important to make sure that it, that you're that you're reminded that you you do manifest your future you do you know the, the decisions you make right now have a huge effect on what's going to come of it yeah. you know I guess it's the art of uh, knowing that you, everything is not within your control but not letting that allow you to just kind of turn into Brad Pitt on the couch with the honey bear bong and true romance you right, know? right 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 yeah it's not yeah yeah it, it, it's a fine balance of being accountable yet surrendering there's like a uh, a, like a freeing, surrendering accountability that you need to balance. You know, like, and I think like being a father is a huge eye-opening experience for that. I would agree with that. Yeah, I think in fact, it it could be a little weird to hear somebody write, whether music or stories or anything, about life in a way that was. Like, that was chuck full of accountability if they didn't have some sort of responsibility whether it be a kid or taking care of your your you know your sick dad whatever mm. like i think that responsibility is what kind of allows you to figure out how to embrace accountability mm-hmm. and, and embrace the fact that you know i am good for this i got this yeah and it give it it gives uh, accountability a a, a a positive because the reward is the achievement of being responsible, right. which has value. But then uh, I also don't want to knock the, the, the free-spirited 22-year-old who's, you know, like, I think that if I try to do it like this, I might come up with results like that. Like, I think that's also really important because without that, you know, we wouldn't have an electric guitar. Right. You know, we wouldn't have, without without people trying to just rip it apart I'm starting to sound like I smoked a bunch of pot and I did it's like, I feel like it's oh, the tetanus yeah you know what it's got that tetanus buzz <laughs> well no I think we're I think we're, we're getting to something though and, and I, I think anything worthwhile is a balance you know like I think anything like, like another way to say it is like moderation but moreation kind of has um, more of like you need to restrict yourself rather than um, intentionally trying to walk this fine line of 
free spirit. But like the image I have is like a free spirit that wanders but develops wings along the way. Mm. You know, like they're moving in the wind, but at the same now we're definitely talking like we're smoking pot. Yeah. But moving in a direction that there that slowly becomes more and more understood and intentional. So there's development and growth. You know, I think that's important. Well, I think it's at least it's important to some of us. You know, it's important right. to me because as a kid, you know, when you're 17, that's when music saves your life. Yeah. Somewhere between 17 and 25. And you're going to be stuck loving those artists for the rest of your life. So <coughs> choose them wisely. Choose them wisely. <laughs> yep. Because you, you'll, you'll, you'll learn to accept other artists. But like right now, I might hear the most amazing music in the world, but it's not going to save my life like yeah. the shit that I heard when I was 17. Right. And... For me, I was lucky, I was fortunate that at 17, the artists that saved my life were connecting with me in a way that was very personal. It was an individual connection. They weren't connecting with me as part of a, a community um, as much as, you know, it, it was headphone music. Yeah. I, 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 headphone music is what saved my life. And now I feel like that's what I make. I make headphone music, you know? I can appreciate if you play one of my songs at the coffee shop or, mm-hmm. or at, at your, you know, at your shoe store or something like that. But but uh, ultimately, in at least in my in my mind, I make music for people who are listening to music through their earbuds at a bus stop. You know. What do you want them to get? Hope. It, just like just like gospel, just like yeah. anything, hope. But a, but a, a relatively a re- realistic, realistic hope. hope. You know. Uh, a hope that is is uh, you're accountable for it. You you have to make the good stuff happen. You, you mm-hmm. can't just sit around and expect it to happen because you kept a smile on your face and a in a, in a in a polite disposition. In fact, quite the opposite. I feel like uh, the hope that I'm talking about requires anything but a polite disposition. And, and, and often, you, it's a hope that you have to take. You have to go out and get that hope aggressively. Yeah. Yeah, because we find it's not something packaged. It's not something packaged that you just pull off the shelf. There's an actual struggle to it. There is a struggle to it. You know, I'd love to believe that I make music for the revolution. When the revolution comes, my music's to be part of it. Not necessarily the part that inspired the revolution, but when you need some easy listening during the revolution, play my shit, you know? And that's not to say I make easy listening music either, but... Because I, I don't believe that what we do is necessarily safe, but it's like, you know, the revolution is going to come, but not all the music should be angry. you got to have some time to also kind of sit back well, and, and take it in and look at things. I, yeah, I mean, a, a comedy is a, a comedy works by a build-up attention and then the release, you know? And I feel like life is a constant build-up attention and then the release, going back to your, your cup therapy or whatever it was like you need to have that moment and I think individuals they encounter music and they take music into their life to find affirmation like somebody who resonates with them yeah maybe not 100% but a little bit in their in their heart like resonates it affirms them and they can release you know it's like it's therapeutic that's I think that's why people associate music with religion like it almost becomes a part of religion because it's giving them a voice that they didn't have before they put it in their ears. Sure. This is just a safe place for us to chill. This is where my practice space is. Oh, sweet. Is they have music there? Um, you know, they did a long time ago when it was a club. Now it's just a big empty room. Okay. Well, man, yeah, to close, I think like I feel like we all we all struggle being vulnerable. But we need to be vulnerable. Like vulnerability is a, is a, you know, it's almost like the the waters can't get through if the gates don't come down. And we need the gates to come down once in a while to get the waters through. But we're so scared in a sense. And having the vulnerability to like put it down, let the waters come in and out, is healthy. And I think it. And I think music helps people do that. Because, and this all goes back to the relating to the accountability and the hope while still being grounded. Music allows somebody who's performing music in some way is becoming vulnerable by whether it's through their performance on stage 
or uh, you know, or or the words they're saying, what they're admitting to, or what the story they're telling, they have to be vulnerable to go there. And I think musicians, in a sense, if don't like, have the potential of becoming icons that can guide people to vulnerability. And I think, like, as a listener, I listen to music and I hear the places people go with their their bodies and their voices and their thought, and it, it, I relate to it, and I let my guard down a little bit. You know, instead of walking around like like a clenched muscle, you know, I I, I relax so I can take the shot. Mm-hmm. To use a metaphor that you just experienced. That was good. You did good there. Yeah. That was a good one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that guy cracks me up. That's Sean Daly, aka Slug, Atmosphere. Uh, I love that guy. He he's he he's hilarious, and uh, that was a really fun hang. So thanks, Sean. I appreciate that. Thank you guys for listening. I also want to thank the License Lab. They give me uh, they let me use their music for the intro and outros. Uh, if you guys need licensing of any sort, if you need music for some kind of project, check out LicenseLab.com. Thank you guys. I appreciate that. Uh, check out Mystery Monday if you want some good stuff. Go to my website for all your Mike Mangione if music podcast needs. MikeMangione.com uh, check up if you want to help uh, support what I'm doing. Go to patreon.com forward slash Mike Mangione. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Mike Mangione. I have a lot more interviews coming, so uh, subscribe to the podcast. Get involved, man. Come talk to me, hang out, be my friend in all those different social media outlets because uh, I'm in it for the long haul. I want you to join me in it as well. Otherwise, it gets lonely and heavy. So Atmosphere has a new record coming out this month, but the one that he just released before was one called Southsiders. And when I was doing this interview, I was listening a lot to that record. And there's one song in particular that I really fell in love with. I liked all the songs, but like there's one that I always came back to because it brought me joy. For whatever reason, it made me happy. And it's a song called Let Me Know That You Know What You Want Now. And for show and tell, I want to share that one with you. Because ultimately, that's what this podcast is about. It's about being happy. I want to help you think a little bit. I want to bring you into some uh, some kind of intense conversations where we look at things that are maybe a little bit bigger than ourselves and uh, ultimately walk away happy. All right? So be nice to each other. Be good to yourself. Forgive yourself. Love yourself. And uh, smile. And let me know that you know what you want now by Atmosphere. I'll see you next time.